I'm going to walk you through an elevation rendering workflow that involves selections, masking, and texturing. I have here a PNG saved from SketchUp with a transparent background. So my first step might be to fill in the background. I'll go to Layer, New Fill Layer, and this will create a pure white solid color that fills the document bounds. I'll drag this underneath the background layer, which is the diagram information. Fill layers are non-destructive and effectively combine solid, gradient, and bitmap fill capabilities into one layer type. When a fill layer is created, Affinity Photo automatically selects the gradient tool, which allows me to click drag and draw out a gradient if I want to. I just want a solid color, however, so I'll undo with Command Z on Mac, Control Z on Windows. Now I can start texturing. For this workflow, I'll first select the background layer, then switch to the Flood Select tool on the Tools panel. Alternatively, I can use W on the keyboard. Now, before bringing in actual image textures, I'll add some textured noise to various parts of the building. On the Context toolbar, I'll switch the selection mode to Add. This will allow me to add multiple areas to the same selection. Alternatively, I could use a keyboard modifier. These may differ between Mac and Windows, so you can always check keyboard modifier behavior down here on the hint line. Before making a selection, I'll enable anti-alias on the context toolbar as well. This will soften the selection around edge pixels, creating a smoother, less jagged transition once I start adding fills and masks. I'll make a selection of these areas by single clicking on each of them. Then I'll go to Layer, New Fill Layer, and finally I'll deselect with Command D on Mac, Control D on Windows. I'll switch across to the Color panel, then click on the panel options here and change to a more intuitive color wheel representation. I'll click drag on this node and change the fill color to a light gray. I can also add some texture to this fill non-destructively. A quick way to do this is to single click on the color icon underneath opacity here, and this will switch to the noise property. I'll drag the slider all the way up to add some procedural noise. Fill layers have their own alpha channels, so we don't need to attach a separate mask layer to them. I'll show you how to add and subtract from this alpha channel. First, I'll switch back to the Flood Select tool with W. Ordinarily, I would have to select the background layer so I can make a selection from the diagram pixel information. However, I can also change Source on the Context toolbar to All Layers, and I'll change the mode to Add again. I can now single click on these areas to add them to a selection whilst keeping the fill layer selected rather than the background layer. Now I'll go to Edit, Fill. I'll already see a preview of the fill effect where the additional areas are now added to the fill layer alpha channel. I'll double check this color is set to pure white. Then click Apply. If you haven't manually changed the primary and secondary colors, they will be set to pure white and pure black by default. This means that with an active selection, you can easily use the fill with primary and secondary color commands to quickly add to or subtract from a mask or alpha channel. For example, if I fill with secondary color, this defaults to pure black, so it will remove these areas from the alpha channel. Then I can fill with the primary color to add them back into the alpha channel. I'll now deselect and move on to texturing with images. With the Flood Select tool still active, I'll click and add these four areas to a new selection. Now I need to place a suitable image and mask it. I'll go out to my file browser and drag drop this wood texture image into my document. This places the image into the document as an image layer. It's a large resolution image, so I need to scale it down. I'll use V to select the Move tool and zoom out. Layer transformations can be performed independent to the marquee selection, so I can keep my selection active whilst I scale this layer down, holding Command on Mac, Control on Windows to scale around the center of the layer. I'll also rotate this layer. Holding Shift will constrain the rotation allowing me to rotate it exactly by
by 90 degrees. All layer transformations are non-destructive regardless of layer type, so I can freely rotate, scale, and shear this layer if required without worrying about compromising the quality. Once the image layer is in place for the areas on the left, I'll add a mask layer to it using this option on the Layers panel. Then deselect. Now I will want to copy this texture and apply it to the right-hand areas. Because I've already included these areas in the mask I just created, I can do this very quickly. I'll select the parent image layer and duplicate it with Command J on Mac, Control J on Windows. Now I just need to make sure Lock Children is enabled on the context toolbar. This will let me drag the image layer across without moving the mask. I can hold Shift to constrain the layer along its horizontal axis if I want the texture alignment to match between the two different areas. I might want to add some shading to these two texture areas. I can do this non-destructively with pixel layers. I'll create a new pixel layer, either with this option on the Layers panel, or by using Shift-Command-N on Mac, Shift-Control-N on Windows. Now I'll click-drag this pixel layer and release the mouse button over the text area of this top wood 01 layer. This will child layer the pixel layer into this image layer and ensure the brushwork I'm about to do remains clipped to the bounds of the mask. I'll change the pixel layer's blend mode to overlay and reduce the opacity to 50% for now. Then I'll use B to switch to the paintbrush tool. On the brushes panel, I'll switch to the masking category and choose a large, soft brush. Now I'll make sure my active color is set to black and brush away around the edges here. The effect is too strong, so I'll lower the opacity to 25%. I'll create the same shading effect on the other wood texture. I'll add a new pixel layer, then drag this into the bottom wood 01 layer. Once again, I'll choose an overlay blend mode and reduce the opacity to 25%, then brush away around the edges. Finally, I'll use H to switch to the view tool, which will prevent me from accidentally clicking and using the brush tool anywhere else. Now I may want to alter the tone or color of both areas simultaneously. A sensible approach for this would be to group them first. I'll collapse both layers to stay organized, then hold Shift and select both of them. I'll then use Command G on Mac, Control G on Windows to group them, and I can double click into this group text to rename it. I'll just call it Wood and use Return to confirm. Now I might add an HSL Shift adjustment with Command U on Mac, Control U on Windows. I'll drag this inside the wood group, and its effect will now be restricted to these two textured areas. Lowering the overall saturation to around minus 30% takes away some of the color intensity and makes the wood tone look more neutral. If I wanted to reduce the brightness of the wood as well, I could lower the luminosity shift slider slightly. Don't forget that this is a non-destructive adjustment. So once I've closed the dialog, I can always hide the adjustment layer and show it again. And I can also single click the thumbnail to reopen the dialog if I want to change the parameters. Now I'll move on and texture some of the other areas. I'll use W to switch to the flood select tool and make sure I've set the mode to add. And because source is still set to all layers, I can now single click to make a selection of these areas without having to select the background layer first. Now, if I'm covering a wide area with a mask, a more efficient approach would be to create a masked group, then place image layers inside that. I'll make sure I'm at the top of the layer stack, then create a group with Command G on Mac, Control G on Windows. Using this shortcut will create an empty group if you only have one layer selected on the layers panel. I'll now add a mask to this group and deselect. Most of the document contents will disappear. Don't panic, this is because the group is currently empty apart from the mask. 
I'll go out to my file browser and drag drop this concrete image in to place it. Now I just need to drag the concrete 01 layer over the group's text to child layer it. The rest of the document contents will now appear again. I can now switch to the Move tool with V and reposition this image. I'll now want to copy this image so I can texture the other areas. A quick approach for this is to Command click on Mac, Control click on Windows, and hold this key down whilst dragging. As we saw earlier, I can also hold Shift to constrain to the axis I'm dragging on. I'll then release the mouse button to confirm the layer transformation. I'll repeat this process for the bottom areas. So I'll clone the layer and move it down here, and I might also rotate it. Then I'll clone this layer and bring it across to the right, scaling it down further. I have some additional areas here where I also want the concrete texture to be displayed. I'll employ the same process I used for the fill layer earlier. I'll switch to the Flood Select tool, make sure my mode is set to Add, make a flood selection of these areas, then select the mask and go to Edit, Fill with Primary Color. Rather than dodging and burning using a pixel layer, I could also experiment with a non destructive lighting filter. I'll select the parent group, then go to Layer, New Live Filter Layer, Lighting. This adds a live lighting filter into the group, which will affect all the concrete image layers. It defaults to a tightly focused spotlight, so I could click drag on the control nodes to reposition the light and also widen the outer cone angle until I'm happy with the result. As with the HSL shift adjustment I used earlier, this is an entirely non destructive procedure. So I can close the dialog, hide, and show the lighting filter, and click on the thumbnail to reopen the dialog if I want to change the effect. To complete this elevation rendering, I'll add some detail to the windows. With my Flood Select tool active, I'll set the mode to Add, Check Source is still set to All Layers, then make a selection of the four windows. I'll add a fill layer, but I'll also just make sure the top layer is selected in my layer stack. This is good practice to make sure the new layer does not end up in a child layer stack somewhere. I'll deselect, and the windows have taken on that same light grey fill with noise that I changed these areas to earlier. On the colour panel, I'll change the colour to a light blue, and I'll remove the noise entirely. To give the windows some more depth, however, I'll change the type on the context toolbar to radial, which will produce a radial gradient. The color I just chose will be assigned to the center gradient stop, which I can click drag and move so it sits between the four windows. A more saturated variation of the color will be assigned to the other gradient stop, and I'll move this closer so that the middle point is positioned between the two windows here. I'll also change this color so it has a darker tone. This then creates a subtle shading effect on the windows, and I can click drag the middle point to change the balance between the two colors. I could of course also experiment with adding some noise back in to this gradient fill. And there we go, that was a look at various techniques for an elevation rendering workflow. Most of what I have demonstrated can also be applied to top-down plan rendering workflows as well. I hope you have found this video useful, and thank you for watching.